Have you ever wondered how the Bible actually came into existence? The Bible is the most reproduced, the most translated, and the most widely spread book in the history of the world. The Bible has been translated into many languages from the original biblical languages of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And as of September of last year, the full Bible has been translated into 704 languages and the New Testament has been translated into an additional 1,551 languages. In the past year alone, according to Wikipedia, more than 100 million Bibles were sold worldwide. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, more than 5 billion copies of the Bible have been printed. So we have to ask, where did the Bible come from? And how has it become the best-selling book of all time? The biblical canon is a collection of 66 spiritual books that God has given to his people. There are 40 authors of the Bible, some scholars, some kings, some prophets, and some fishermen. The term canon comes from a Hebrew Greek word meaning cane or measuring rod. And when it's used in Christian terms, it means the rule of faith. The fathers of the Christian faith in the fourth century first used the word canon in reference to what they considered the sacred word of God, or what we'll refer to here as biblical literature, the texts from the authors of scripture which make up the Bible today. So the biblical canon were the books grouped together by God's people relatively early, with the Old Testament being settled upon by the time of the birth of Jesus at the latest, and the writings of the New Testament getting large agreement among Christian leaders before the end of the second century. And even though it wasn't until the fourth century that the New Testament canon was officially decided, there's good reason to have historical confidence in the process because all of the writings of the New Testament were written in the first century, either firsthand accounts of the events or very close to the time that those events in those books actually took place. The writings of the New Testament were largely decided upon by virtue of their divine qualities and their connection to an original apostle, one of the disciples who lived and walked with Jesus. And those that were not authored by the original apostles have close links to the testimony of the apostles themselves, like Mark and Luke, Mark being a follower of both apostles Paul and Peter, and Luke being a companion of the apostle Paul. The history of the interval between the Old and New Testaments is often regarded by Bible scholars as of little importance because no divinely inspired prophets spoke during that 400 year period. And because of that, the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament is often referred to as the silent centuries. At the same time, a knowledge of the events leading up to the birth of Jesus, as well as the literature during that 400 year period is valuable because they furnish both a cultural and political background for the coming of Christ. For 200 years after the Babylonian captivity, which ended around 537 BC, the province of Judea remained under Persian rule. Then in 330 BC, the conquest of Alexander the Great not only brought the Jews under Grecian rule, but also introduced the Greek language and Greek ideas throughout the ancient world. Greek became the predominant written language of the day and the New Testament was written in Greek, not Hebrew. After the death of Alexander, his kingdom was divided, which led to the struggle between the Ptolemies of Egypt and the monarchs of the Seleucid kingdom, which resulted first in the Egyptians ruling Judea and later the Seleucid kingdom, which stretched from Turkey, Syria, Iraq, all the way to Iran and beyond. When the Seleucid kingdom ruled Judea, it was a dark period in Jewish history, especially during the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes, who committed many outrages against the Jews, and he sought to establish idolatry in Jerusalem and defiled the Jewish temple. The idolatry that Antiochus brought to Jerusalem and the defiling of the temple led to the Maccabean revolt in 166 BC, in which the priest Matthias and his sons overthrew their oppressors and secured the independence of the province of Judea. And finally, in 63 BC, the Roman general Pompey entered Judea with Roman forces and captured Jerusalem. The Romans ruled Judea through a local king and largely allowed the Jews free religious practice in Judea. 
Herod the Great became king of Judea in 37 BC under the umbrella of the Roman government, basically because of his support of the Roman Empire. So this brings us to the birth of Jesus in about 4 BC. There were several books written during the 400 year period from the writing of the book of Malachi, which is the last book in the Old Testament, to the time of the birth of Jesus. These books are not included in the Bible that we know today, and they're known as the Apocrypha, which means hidden or secret. The reason they were hidden is because the early fathers of the faith essentially decided that they should not be included with the sacred scriptures. The Apocrypha include the first and second books of Esdras, the books of Tobit and Judith, additions to Esther, the book of Ecclesiasticus, the book of Baruch, and the first, second, third, and fourth books of the Maccabees and several others. Although it's commonly agreed that some of the books of the Apocrypha contain material of literary merit and historical value, their legitimacy has been rejected by later compilations of the Bible we don't want to get ahead of ourselves here, but it's interesting to note that in the 16th century, Martin Luther was working on a German translation of the Bible, translating it from Latin to German in order that the common people of his country could start reading it for themselves. The first part of Luther's Old Testament translation appeared in 1523, and over the next 12 years, working with a group of translators, he completed the German translation of the whole Bible, and it was published in 1534. Luther's German translation was soon to become the standard version for the Protestant Bible. So this brings us to the primary point of our discussion today, the origin of the 66 books that now appear in the Bible, 39 in the Old Testament and 27 books in the New Testament, and how they were translated from their original Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek writings into English. We're not gonna get into the authorship of the books of the Bible here. You're probably already aware of many of the authors, which include Moses, King David, Solomon, Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, and others. But we wanna take a look at the process of the gradual development of the English Bible from the original ancient manuscripts. We're living in an age of printing today, so it's hard for us to realize that when the books of the Bible were originally written, there was no printing press to multiply the copies. Each copy had to be made slowly and laboriously by hand. And under those conditions, it was inevitable that some of the ancient books should be lost. And this largely accounts for the fact that some of the original manuscripts of the Bible have perished. The question now arises, what have we then as the literary foundation of our Bible. First of all, we have the most ancient copies made from the original manuscripts. We will mention here only the three principal ones. We refer to these manuscripts as codex, which is a compilation of manuscript pages held together by stitching, which is the earliest form of a book replacing scrolls and wax tablets of earlier times. The first of these ancient manuscripts is the Codex Sinaiticus, originally a codex from the original Greek Bible belonging to the fourth century, which was purchased from the Soviet Union in 1933 by Great Britain and is now on public display in the British Museum in London. It includes about half of the Old Testament and all of the New Testament. The second of these ancient manuscripts is the Codex Alexandrinus, written in the fifth century, which is also now on display in the British Museum in London. It contains the entire Greek Bible with the exception of 40 lost pages. And the third of the ancient manuscripts, which is written in Greek, is the Codex Vaticanus, which is held today in the Vatican Library in Rome. It originally contained the whole Bible and was transcribed in the fourth century. The very first complete versions of the Bible, including both the Old and the New Testaments, were compiled in the first, second, and fourth centuries. The Septuagint Bible arose in the third century BC when the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament was translated into Greek. The name Septuagint derives from the Latin word Septuaginta, which means 70. The Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible is called Septuagint because 70 or 72 Jewish scholars reportedly took part in the translation process. The Syriatic version of the Bible was translated in the first or second century into the common language of Syria. 
The Vulgate version of the Bible was translated into Latin by Jerome at Bethlehem and was completed in 400 AD. For 1,000 years, this was the standard Bible of the Catholic Church. Jerome was a biblical translator and early leader of the Catholic Church, traditionally regarded as the most learned of the Latin Fathers. During the Dark Ages, from around 476 to 1000 AD, very little Bible translation was attempted. There were a few minor translations made of portions of the Bible, but the Bible was pretty much locked up in the Latin tongue, which was unknown to the common people. In 1320, John Wycliffe, a renowned English Bible scholar, conceived the plan of translating the whole Bible into common English. He first translated the New Testament in about 1380. Exactly how much more he did before his death is uncertain. His friends completed the work after his death. Wycliffe's translation was derived mainly from the Latin Vulgate. William Tyndale was the next in order of the great English translators. He was an early and courageous reformer and was determined that the English common people would have the Bible in their own tongue. Persecution made it impossible for him to do his work in England, so he crossed over to the continent where his English New Testament translation was completed in 1525 and the first five books of the Bible in 1530. Tyndale's version does not rest entirely on the Latin Vulgate, as did Wycliffe's. Tyndale was a Greek scholar and had access to the Greek text that Wycliffe did not have. Tyndale also possessed a fine command of accurate English, which left its impression on all later English versions of the Bible. In 1535, Tyndale was captured in Antwerp, convicted of heresy by the Roman Catholic Inquisition, and in 1536, he was burned at the stake. We're going to fast forward here now past several other early versions of the Bible that were translated in the 1500s. There was the Coverdale version in 1535, the Matthews Bible in 1537, the Great Bible in 1539, the Geneva Bible in 1560, and the Bishop's Bible in 1568, most of which were based on Tyndale's work, which was in turn based on the Vulgate and ancient copies of the original manuscripts. Let's go now to the King James Version of the Bible, which was first published in 1611 and has, for many years, been the translation now generally used by English-speaking people around the world. In 1604, King James I of England authorized a new translation of the Bible aimed at settling some thorny religious differences. Thanks to emerging printing technology at that time, the new translation brought the Bible out of the church's sole control and directly into the hands of more people than ever before, including the Protestant reformers who settled in England's North American colonies in the 17th century. Emerging at a high point in the English Renaissance, the King James Bible held its own among the most celebrated literary works in the English language. Its majestic rhythm would inspire generations of artists, poets, musicians, and political leaders, while many of its specific phrases worked their way into the fabric of English language itself. Even now, more than four centuries after its publication, the King James Version of the Bible remains the most famous Bible translation in history and one of the most printed books ever.